Hello everyone, and welcome to Difference Engines, Mechanical Brains, Analog Computers. Today we are going to explore the world of computing before electronics. And we're going to learn how cogs and calculators and bones and beads once made up the cutting edge of computing technology. But before we learn all of that, we are going to learn a few other things. First, you're going to learn that today you either A, saw this really amazing program, or B, you saw this really terrible program by a guy named Dr. Silas Conundrum from a company called Stempunk Ed. Stempunk Ed is a company I formed with my two young children because we loved to explore STEM together. That's science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, but we love to do so using technology from the 17th century to the early 20th century, anything before the evil laziness of the microchip. Or put another way, we teach how STEM was done for the 500 years that came before the last 50 years. In today's program, our goal is to trace the evolution of computing devices from their first appearance in 20,000 BCE Africa to just before the dawn of the digital age. Our format, in this case, is just going to be an online presentation, but you will get a preview of the equipment I bring to my in-person programs where students will have a chance to have hands-on experiences using vintage tech from the 17th to early 20th centuries. So as we go through here, look for the following important ideas to remember. First of all, a proper definition of a computer that can describe it in any of its forms, not just limiting itself to the electronic forms that you think of today as computers. So a computer is a device that has blank and blank. We're going to describe the computing eras and what I call the two major analog eras that preceded modern digital computing. And those areas, excuse me, those eras can be described as blank and blank. You will know that when we're done. And lastly, you'll be able to identify three analog foundations of modern computing, three things that had nothing to do with digital when they were found and were found long before anything electronic was even considered, yet they are the basis of modern digital computing. First, let's learn what is a computer. Please listen to this short video and take a moment to think about what it says. What exactly is a computer? A computer is an electronic device that manipulates information or data. The computer sees data as ones and zeros, but it knows how to combine them into more complex things, such as a photograph, a movie, a website, a game, and much more. Modern computers are revolutionizing our lives, performing tasks unimaginable only decades ago. Well, at their core, all computers are just what the name implies, machines that perform mathematical operations. The earliest computers were manual counting devices, like the abacus, while later ones used mechanical parts. What made them computers was having a way to represent numbers and a system for manipulating them. So this video actually has two parts. It begins by talking about computers and defining them in terms of modern technology. But the most important part is a more expansive definition that encompasses all levels of technology of computers. And that is a device that has a way to represent numbers and a system for manipulating them. The numbers that are manipulated by a modern computer are the numbers 0 and 1, binary code. And no matter what computer you use, whether it's a Mac or a PC, whether it's a Samsung Galaxy phone or an iPhone, 
whether it's your toaster oven or whether it is your automatic thermostat. No matter what programming languages are involved, underneath it all, every one of those devices and every digital device in the world operates on only binary code or the numbers zero and one. But older devices didn't use binary code. Older devices used base 10 systems instead of base two binary base 10, the numbers zero through nine. And that's what we're going to be learning about today. But nonetheless, whether it's a modern device or an ancient one, a computer always has a way to represent numbers and a system for manipulating them. Bones and beads, the earliest computers in basic materials. The era of bones and beads is the first era of computing, and it goes back much farther than you may think. The Ashango bones, a numeral system engraved on baboon fibulas. When these were first discovered, they were initially thought to simply be tally marks, meaning a way for someone to keep track of how many of this they have or how many of that they have as it comes in or goes out. But further inspection revealed that the Ashango bones were actually a system for converting between base seven math and base 10 math. And that conversion was necessary at the time where this was made as a way to convert between types of inventory of grains and foods kept in sevens and currency in tens. So what was early seen as simply a bunch of hash marks turned out to be one of the earliest deep computing devices for converting between base systems and numbers. Much later than 20,000 years ago, in 2500 BCE, the abacus became the more modern calculator. And you may have seen abaci in work. Let's take a closer look at how they're used even today. Suan pan. Suan pan. The structure of Suan pan is quite simple. It is composed by beads, which represent numbers, and wooden sticks, which represent decimals. Suanpan can be used to accomplish complicated calculations quickly with simple formulas and rules. Twelve-year-old Kota Kizuka. I practice two hours on weekdays and ten hours on the weekend. I want to become the national champion. Along with the other high flyers, he can now do huge calculations with a purely imaginary abacus, manipulating nothing but thin air. An ancient device, still well alive in the modern world. We're gonna jump ahead quite a while and move into Europe. In 1614, John Napier created something he called Napier's Bones. It was a method for using bones, honest to goodness bones at the time, but also wooden slats to create multiplication, generating and solving tiles. So you could also do division with them as well as square roots and cube roots, all by placing these tiles in certain orders. Let's take a look at how Napier's bones worked. We're multiplying 845 by 47. Now to get the bones, we'll need to get an eight. Four and a five. And you can see three, two, one, six, two, zero is what you'd do. Three, two, one, six, two, zero. 
and we now need the units which is 7 so it's just 5, 6, 2, 8, 3, 5, 5, 6, 2, 8, 3, 5 all you do now is add down the diagonals it's the same as what you did with just one bone but now you've got two bones so there down that diagonal gives you 5 that diagonal gives you 8 and 3 is 11 we get 1 and 6 is 7 9 15 17 carry the 1 you get 6 7 8 9 and you've got a 3 there so our answer is 39,715. Now, you may not have guessed that John Napier was a Scotsman, but certainly this might bring it home to you. The simple principle is thus. On the left, you will see a series of numbers 1 to 9. That is the way you're going to begin your multiplication. That is your multiplicand, the first part of a multiplication problem where you will draw it from. Across the top is the multiplier. So 845 times 47. If you look across from the four on the left-hand side, going across the columns, you see the numbers three slash two, one slash six, and two slash zero. You simply copy those over to the lattice work for the first set of digits, 3, 2, 1, 6, 2, 0. And then for the second number, the ones place 7 in 47. So we have the tens place 4, the 1 place 7. We move down to the 7 on the left hand bone, read across 5, 6, 2, 8, 3, 5. Once we have the units for both tens and hundreds, and then, excuse me, once we have our units for hundreds, tens, and ones for 845, and our units for tens and ones for 47, we have them written out here, we simply add across the diagonals. Starting at the far right with a number in red is five. Eight plus three going up is 11. Take the one, move it over. One plus six is seven plus 2 is 9, plus 6 is 15, plus 2 is 17, and so on. And it turns out by just doing simple addition along these lattices, you are able to find the answer to complex multiplication problems. In my program, I do have two sets in my physical program of Napier's bones that you can use hands-on time and an instruction sheet to guide you through how to perform calculations using Napier's bones, both multiplication and division, which takes a bit longer to understand, but is well worth doing. Napier also came up with a precursor idea to what would later be Leibniz's binary. It was called his additive non-positional non -positional local arithmetic. It was essentially a way of using binary math to add large numbers in base 2 and have those answers come out in base 10. So base 10 numbers really become base 2 and then back to base 10. Um, I, uh, in during the program, when we have live time for this program, there are two Napier local arithmetic boards to work with. And these boards not only teach you how binary and base 10 conversion works, but it also shows you exactly how modern computing does binary arithmetic. Because it turns out Napier's board represents the columns or registries in binary that a computer uses to shift up and down to manage its addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division operations. Now, my very favorite of all of the antique computing devices from the bones and beads category, Ott Reed's slide rule. For 350 years, the slide rule was the computing device used by everybody in the STEM fields. And it may be a 
a orienting concept to know that the journey we took to the moon and back, the majority of the calculations done to design and build the rocket and to do all of the math that it took to get to the moon was done on slide rules before they were done on computers. So the slide rule took us to the moon and back in every way as much as an electronic computer did. And for 350 years, if you were doing math, this was what you went to. Let's watch a slide rule in action. William Ottreed's invention in 1622. The slide rule is used to solve mathematical problems and to solve them quickly. Here the rule is being used for the calculations in designing a bridge structure. The slide rule provides answers that are accurate to the degree required in most engineering problems. The procedure for multiplication, 192 times 2. Set the hairline on 192, 192, and to it set the index of C. Move the hairline to 2. Under the hairline, read the answer 384 on D. 380 for 384. Remember, the settings and procedure would be the same if ciphers and decimals were involved. Here is a post 30 feet high, casting a shadow 5 feet long. The tower casts a shadow 54.5 feet long. How high is the tower? The problem may be stated in terms of proportion. 5 is to 30, as 54.5 is to x. To 3 on D, slide 5 on C. Push the hairline to 5, 4, 5 on C. Under the hairline, read the answer, 327 on D. The height of the tower is 327 feet. These are only a few out of the wide variety of problems that can be worked with a standard slide rule. That may have looked like magic to many of you. But with careful study and a little bit of guidance, you can find that the slide rule is surprisingly easy to use for calculations and can be used for calculations much higher than you might think and far more complex. In fact, the slide rule, depending on its version and its number of scales, or those little lines and numbers you see, can do up to 36 different kinds of math with the average high-end slide rule doing 24 different kinds of math. And that's after you take away addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division, that means you still have 20 more kinds of math to do. Pretty darn skippy stuff. And in the program, I have a selection of slide rules at a slide rule station that I help you learn to do basic calculations with. And I also have a full program for the same thing that focuses specifically on slide rules. Related to Napier's bones and the slide rule is something called the Genet Lucas rulers. It is actually a graphical integer based system calculating tool. It is hard for me to describe this to you and the video doesn't work for some reason. But if I zoom in here, I will try to give you some basic concept. Each of these oddly shaped triangles are representative of a solution to a given multiplication problem in this case. So across the top, you see the digits one through zero, and then down the left-hand side, you see digits one through nine. These can be arranged, these Genet Lucas rules, in order to do multiplication problems and you read the answer from right to left. The Genet Lucas rules could do multiplication and division, and they were invented for the purpose of helping people, giving them a graphical user interface for those who could not or learn how to use the slide rule. So again, why are these bones and beads the first era 
of analog computing. How are these computers? In every case, they are a device that has a way to represent numbers and a system for manipulating them. In the case of the slide rule, the numbers are on the scales. A way for manipulating them involves moving the slide at the center and this thing called a cursor across the top to create equations and their solutions. We move now to the second era of pre-digital computing, the era I call cogs and calculators, where we use gears to put the mental manipulation of numbers into machines. One of the very earliest for this was called Pascal's Pascaline. Blaise Pascal invented it. It was the first calculator, mechanical calculator, to be widely produced and used, widely being a relative term, of course. Let's take a look at how it worked. So the Pascaline used a series of dials across the front and a stylus for rotating those dials. Movements to the right would lead to increased numbers for addition. Movements to the left would decrease numbers for subtraction. Here we're going to enter 28, 2, and then 8, 2 in the tens, and then 8 in the ones. And two, we're going to add 35. So we add three in the tens and five in the ones. And the gears move the numbers up and down the scales. Really an ingenious little device. You could also do multiplication and division with it with just a few little extra tips to keep in mind. That device vanished for a very long time until around 1920 or so when the odometer was created. The uh, reliable typewriter odometer took the very idea of Pascal's Pascaline, repackaged it in a smaller and definitely more durably designed case and component system, and became the go-to calculator for road travel or pocket travel for a very long time. And we have a few of those to use also during live programs. Becoming far more complex than the Pascaline was Babbage's difference engine. His attempt to create a mechanical computing device that would tabulate polynomial functions. He never finished it in his lifetime. However, he left behind very detailed plans for how the device was to work and then was reconstructed um, by scientists over time to create a working model. Of all the scientists who dreamt of an automatic calculating machine, Charles Babbage came closest to the modern day computer. In 1822, Babbage presented his still unfinished difference engine, which was designed to solve complex equations. Thousands of cogwheels intermeshed. In this way, algorithms were turned into complex mechanical operations. The difference engine was never completed. This reconstruction of the unfinished machine stands in a museum in London. Astonishing machine to look at if you have time to watch full videos in high definition. Just beautiful to see it carrying out its calculations. Babbage, one of the reasons he never finished the design or the building, I should say, of his um, difference engine was he had moved on to a much larger concept, the analytical engine. The analytical engine was meant to be a general purpose computer meant to solve many different kinds of equations and to do so more or less on the fly. He was aided in his design and development of this machine as well as in trying to get money to fund it by Ada Lovelace, who by all rights is the world's first computing marketer as well as computer software engineer, as she designed the methods and systems by which the machine could operate before it had even been completely designed using the base mechanical principles that she had learned. In 1833, Babbage had shelved the difference engine. He was now dreaming of an even more complex calculating machine. 
His new analytical engine was intended to solve not just specific arithmetical tasks, but every conceivable mathematical problem. Here in Cambridge, mathematics professor Babbage devised the first real computer with an arithmetic unit and a memory. He planned to feed in the programs with punched cards. Babbage's problem was that he was completely dependent on mechanical systems. At the time, there was nothing else available. But a steam-operated automatic calculator would have weighed several tons. So this idea, too, came to nothing. With his dream of an analytical engine, the first universal computer, Babbage was at least a century ahead of his time. Again, an astounding concept. The idea of a completely multi-purpose computer based on mechanical principles. The way the computer worked would have been quite ingenious, really. You will see here in this diagram, um, at the bottom right, a series of punch cards that you see on a, uh, they look like very large index cards. This would have been the method for feeding in information, um, numbers and formulas into the computer. It would have then pr been processed through its central processing unit, which you see towards the center with a large gear driving it. This would have been the closest thing to a CPU in this mechanism. And memory would have been the long series of gears you see down to the left, the memory store, he called it. Output would also be generated through both punch cards as well as a printing device, which is not shown here, to create printed copies of the results of all of the calculations. A marvelous concept and, of course, well beyond the engineering abilities of the time. But something that did come close to meeting Babbage's designs was a 1912 invention by Hazen and Bush called the Differential Analyzer, a fully programmable mechanical computer, rather than being one solid unit that was already in place, would have to be assembled based on what functions, what equations you wanted to solve. Basically, you program this device by physically moving certain gears and certain shafts into locations and then turning the machine on and letting them spin and whirl to process the calculation for the equation. Let's take a look. The University of California at Los Angeles, one of America's top flight educational institutions, did much to bring victory in World War II with its important scientific contributions. Complex as UCLA's cyclotron is its new differential analyzer. This amazing mechanical brain quickly solves mathematical problems that would require months by ordinary computing methods. Gears of many types introduce coefficients combined to give various ratios. The analyzer can juggle them all without breaking a single formula. Qualities are represented by revolving shafts. The highly versatile machine adds, subtracts, multiplies, divides, integrates, and puts arbitrary functions into the problem, all mechanically. Here are programmers programming. Now, engineering students can concentrate on other important matters. For the thinking machine not only answers questions, it actually draws the solutions, charting the function of each variable. After the machine has turned over a problem in its mind, the answer is delivered at one of the output tables. So that mere humans won't misinterpret the solution, it is plotted with automatic recording pens. This is truly one of science's great achievements. I'm sure Babbage would have been proud to see that his ideas were carried through in at least some form. Now, a form I first became aware of when it comes to mechanical computing quite a long time ago was through my love of old Navy battleships, these giant fortresses of the sea that ruled the sea before aircraft and aircraft carriers became the predominant method of fighting battles at sea. This was electromechanical analog ballistic computer that used simple gears and ratios 
to create complex mechanical formulas that would then be solved based on the machinery inside. It's as if the actual equations were worked into the geometry of the mechanical parts and solutions would be churned out based on the movement of those mechanical parts. Here we see a battleship firing all of its major cannons in one volley and just look at the raw power there. It cre creates giant divots in the ocean um, from the force of those shells coming out. The computer is called the Ford Mark 1A computer. Just amazing, just amazing. So unfortunately, I don't have anything as cool as either a Babbage engine or a Ford Mark 1A computer, but I do have one of the world's first produced mechanical pinwheel-based gear-driven calculators called the Odner Arithmometer. Now, I don't bring this one to class because it's an original 1800-something calculator, but I do have the more modern 60s versions of this calculator called the Mentors. Let's take a look at how they worked. You would move a dial up or down to enter a number that you would use as part of your equation, as pins would either go up and down to indicate the number, those pins would then engage a counter wheel to enter a digit into what was called a register. A series of these wheels counted for more place values. The more disks you had, the higher place values you could work. The amounts would then be transferred to this bottom area here for what's called an accumulator register. Numbers would be moved up and down place values by what was called a sensing lever. So when you get to nine, or in this case 19, in order to move to 20, the sensing lever would move out and take the set next place value and move it up. Here we're seeing a large number of figures being added together and we are seeing a device that tracked the number of rotations which you would use to manage multiplication and division operations. So in the program you would have a chance to work on these as well, these Walther calculators. This is probably my favorite form of mechanical calculator. It's sturdy as anything and uh, it stood the test of time really well and they were meant to be used hard and used long and I restored both of mine um, so they work quite well at least as much as you can when you can't find parts for a 50 plus year old calculator. Another version of this slightly less durable was the Monroe calculator. Now they made some really large models that would work beautifully. They were not pinwheel based, they were um, gear, small gear based. The models I have were easy to come by because they were made for executives to have on their desk. And as we all know, executives don't do any real work. So these would sit on the desk just to look pretty, never get used, and they were never designed to be used that much. They're very finicky um, and very fragile overall, but I have beef them up enough for the limited use that we see in my programs. And so you would also have a chance to use one of these as part of the hands-on explorations. So again, why is this next era of calculation machines, cogs and calculators considered computers? Again, they have a way to represent numbers 
and a system for manipulating them. The numbers are represented by teeth and gears and a way of manipulating them, carrying levers, carrying sensors, multiple place values, etc., rotating drums. Those are ways of manipulating them, using them to do calculations. Now, I mentioned at the beginning that the modern era of computing was actually dependent upon innovations that happened long before the idea of electronics ever came to be. Three areas that we're looking at here is the development of binary math from Leibniz, the use of uh, someone named Jacquard, who created a auto weaving loom for weaving patterns and the way he used to program those patterns, and Boole, Boole's algebraic logic. Those three things would come together to enable the modern computer age. Let's look at binary for a moment. Leibniz binary is a number system based on the powers of two. Our normal system that we work in is base 10. The digits zero to nine can be represented in place values of ones, tens, hundreds, thousands, ten thousands, hundred thousands, and so on each of those being a power of 10. Base two uses only the powers of two and you only have the digits zero and one to work with, but because you can put them in place values, just like you can put the, the digits zero through nine in ones, tens, hundreds, and thousands, you can put the digits zero or one in place values of one, two, four, 8, 16, 32, and so on, and in combinations, create mapping between base 2 numbers and base 10 numbers. So you can do base 2 math, but come out with base 10 numbers with the right conversions. Let's take a short look into Leibniz's binary, shall we? Welcome to Math Bytes. Today we'll talk about binary numbers, also known as base 2. Base 2 is an alternate way of expressing numbers, which has many applications, including that the device upon which you are currently watching this video speaks at its very core a language in binary code. Ones and zeros, baby. It's true, the image you see is not really me, rather a base 2 representation of this so-called me. But before we can understand binary numbers, we should take a closer look at our own decimal number system, the good old familiar base 10. In base 10, we have 10 symbols at our disposal for representing numbers. As you know, in various combinations, the symbols can represent any number of objects we can think of using something called place value, which gives us a lot more bang for the buck for a mere 10 little symbols, if you know what I mean. Each column of numbers represents multiplication times the power of 10. There's the ones place, 10 to the zero power, tens place, 10 to the one power, hundreds place, 10 to the two power, and so on. So when you see a number like 375 in base 10, you're really seeing this. Most of the world uses these symbols along with powers of 10 and has for a long, long time. It's a great system. In binary, instead of using 10 symbols and powers of 10, we use just two symbols and powers of two. And we can still express big numbers using just two symbols. Base two or binary works the same way as the decimal system. But this time, each column of numbers represents multiplication times the power of two. There's the ones place, two to the zero power, twos place, two to the one power, fours place, two to the two power, and so on. Of course, it's a lot harder to express big numbers this way. You need a lot more digits. So if it's that inefficient, why do computers use it? Well, it's how they store and relay information. Because the core of computers is just electronics after all. And for any given pathway on a circuit board, either a current is flowing or it's not. Yes, no, on, off, one, zero, binary. Your heart and your So Leibniz in the late 1600s had no idea that this concept of base two or binary math would be the perfect thing to use to allow computers, which are ultimately just a giant array of circuits that only have options on or off, zero or one, to combine those in very complex ways to create the digital experiences we know as photographs, movies, games, and websites. But there it was, just waiting for future inventors to find. 
in the program, we would have a binary marble calculator. It's a wooden calculator that uses marbles and binary switches, left, right, flip flops, to process addition in the same way that a computer does with inputs, memory processing, and outputs. And we could practice learning and applying binary math using this lovely little design. To learn more about binary operations, and in particular, the history of binary behind modern computing, as well as the process for converting between base 10, or the digits zero through nine, and base two, the digits zero and one, please visit my website, stempunked.com. From that website, you'll be able to click on our free resources page, and towards the top of that page, you will find a video that explains all of this in more detail. It will be titled, Computer History and Hands-On Binary. Now you may say to yourself, wow, that must have been hard. I'm glad I can just type numbers and type characters into my computer. Well, guess what? Even though you see on your keyboard letters and numbers, the computer only sees the binary equivalents of the numbers and letters you are entering. So for example, if you were to type the character A, which you see on the right-hand side of this box, the computer sees an encoded binary equivalent of the letter A, which is 100001. Letter C, it sees not the letter C, it sees 1100001, but it knows the fancy computer that it is, the clever clock that it is, that when it wants to display that number back to you, or that letter, excuse me, the letter C, it converts from binary to the character C for you on the screen. And so it is true for any character on the keyboard, there is a binary equivalent. Now, if you say to yourself, I'm having a hard time believing that movies, music, photos, all of this is just zeros and ones. I mean, how can something so complex as a movie or a game come from only two things, the numbers zero and one. Well, try this on for size. Every thought you will ever have in English, every sentence you will ever speak, or everything you try to express in words written or spoken will always only be made up of 26 letters and 10 digit combinations. Everything you will ever communicate if that doesn't bring it quite home, if you know about genetics, you know that DNA, the code that makes up all life on our planet, all DNA is made up of only four chemicals arranged in pairs. So four chemicals arranged in pairs in different combinations over and over and over again across billions and trillions of individual entries, shall we say, make up all the life on this planet. So if four things can make up all life and the code for all life on this planet, it seems pretty reasonable that two things, zero and one, can make a movie or a video game. Jacquard's loom. Jacquard used punched hold cards to be able to program a loom to weave complex patterns. Essentially, the holes were like binary. If there was a hole in the card, a shaft would move through that hole, signaling the machine to weave in a certain spot. If there was no hole in the card, a shaft could not move through the card and trigger the machine, and no thread would be weaved in a certain part. So a hole would be yes, weave, or the digit one, no hole would be no, don't weave, or a digit zero. So these cards were a way of using binary code to program a wooden loom to weave a cloth fabric a certain way. Let's look.
Here first, an artist designs the pattern, and then a programmer of sorts converts that pattern into a series of punched cards. Those cards here are stitched together and fed through the loom, and a series of shafts reads each card. Again, if the hole goes, if you, there's a hole, the shaft goes through, signaling a weave. No hole, no shaft goes through, no weave. And here we have yes, no weaving of patterns and something so simple as yes, no in complex movements can take a machine like this and allow it to weave a beautifully complex fleur-de-lis pattern. So here we have an, two actual expressions of binary Leibniz, simple binary math and punch cards for binary programming of patterns. And last spot, but not least, Boolean algebraic logic or Boole's algebra. We're gonna take a trip into library land to have them explain to you how Boole's logic and Boolean logic works. Using Boolean operators, brought to you by CSUSB's John M. Pfau Library. In this video, we'll demonstrate how to use the Boolean operators AND, OR, and NOT. Using these operators can help narrow or broaden your searches in the library's databases. An easy way to narrow your search is to use the word AND between two or more keywords. Though AND is the default for most databases and you typically will not have to type it out, it's useful to know how it works. AND retrieves only those results that contain all of your keywords. For example, a search for cat and dog will retrieve only those results that contain both keywords, not simply one or the other. However, if you want to expand your search, use the Boolean operator OR, cat or dog. This technique will allow you to retrieve results that contain the keywords cat, dog, or cat and dog. For a more sophisticated search, combine the Boolean operators AND and OR. For example, let's say we want results about cats or dogs or birds, but we also want these results to address animal welfare. First, we would place parentheses around cats or dogs or birds as if it were a mathematical equation. We would then add animal welfare using the Boolean operator AND. Finally, you can use the Boolean operator NOT to exclude keywords from your search results. For example, if I want to retrieve information about animals but not dogs, I would search like this, animals not dogs. And even though I actually love dogs, using NOT eliminates what I don't want, saving me time and energy I would have otherwise spent combing through my results. For more information on Boolean operators, please visit my website, stempunked.com, click on Free Resources, and scroll down until you see the video, Boolean Logic Ice Cream. You'll learn more about Boolean operators, their role in computer systems, and how to use Boolean operators to order your favorite ice cream. Let's look at this now. This is the dawn of the digital age, the true most powerful example of modern computing, the IBM System 360. Let's look at a short video that talks about the power of this computer and look to see how all of these combinations come into play of binary math, punch cards, and Boolean logic. You may not realize it, but the chances are that a machine such as this one has already affected your everyday life. Complex as they look, electronic computers operate on a very simple principle. Being electronic, they have circuits that can be opened or closed, switches that can be off or on. Its understanding and its answers are limited to these two possibilities. Since this is true, how can we translate reams of data 
thousands of words, complicated formulas, into the yes-no signals that the computer can understand. The answer is binary arithmetic, a system that uses only two digits, one and zero. Information to be fed into a computer is often encoded on cards, then transferred to magnetic tape for input to the computer. Holes punched in the card represent the letters, numbers, and symbols. This data can be recorded on magnetic tape by magnetic recording heads, whose poles may be north or south, corresponding to one and zero. If data is fed into a computer from paper or plastic tape, groups of holes punched in the tape represent decimal and letter symbols. This data is stored in the computer's memory unit for use in solving problems. Tiny magnetic cores threaded on wires store one bit on each core. A current of electricity passing through a core sets up a magnetic field that may be clockwise or counterclockwise, corresponding to one or zero. In solving a problem, data in a magnetic core memory is stored, recalled, compared, calculated, checked, and restored at a rate of many thousands of calculations per second. The control unit directs each step according to the program punched in the tape. Thousands of electric circuits like these in the arithmetic unit connect transistors that act as switches. The transistors are seen here as silver cylinders in the center. For storage of data on rotating disks mounted like records in a record machine. Minute spots magnetized on the drum surface represent one. Unmagnetized spots, zeros. Regardless of appearance, all electronic computers operate on the same basic principle, using simple language of coded signals, signified by circuits that are off or on. The productive activity of people in the future will to a large extent rest in their knowledge of computers and how to use them. So don't let the age of that video fool you. It is still, today, every device's core operating principle, binary math, Boolean logic, and at some level, zeros and ones being read as the entry and input as well as the output, but then converted to other forms. And Boolean logic gates are then what enables that combination of zeros and ones to become complex enough to carry out the functions that underlie modern computing. Most computers use a type of math called Boolean logic that has only two possible values, the logical conditions true and false, denoted by binary digits one and zero. They are represented by high and low voltages. Equations are implemented via logic gate circuits that produce an output of one or zero based on whether the inputs satisfy a certain logical statement. These circuits perform three fundamental logical operations, conjunction, disjunction, and negation. The way conjunction works is an AND gate provides a high voltage output only if it receives two high voltage inputs, and the other gates work by similar principles. Circuits can be combined to perform complex operations like addition and subtraction, and computer programs consist of instructions for electronically performing these operations. At trillions of calculations per second, today's computers may seem like they're performing miracles, but underneath it all, each individual operation is still as simple as the flick of a switch. And that says it all. So, the digital world that we take for granted today is rooted in the analog. Leibniz binary, 1679, the Jacquard loom, 1801, and Boole's Boolean logic in 1847. The most astounding thing about this is these three inventors worked in a world where they could have never imagined the world that you take for granted. But the world they knew was the world of antique calculation systems that relied on beads and bones, cogs and calculators.
to perform all known methods of computer calculation. The very nature of the world you live in now is based on a world that you have no idea of now, or at least that was true until now that you've seen this program. Thank you so much for your time. Please, when you have a chance, visit my website, stempunked.com, to look at all of our innovative and unusual programs for teaching STEM using technology from the 17th to early 20th centuries. Thank you so much, and I hope you have a great day.